Welcome back to the Spectre Creative Channel, and today we're talking about something a little different, but still the same. I love dinosaurs. And on a channel that is mostly about toys, with your occasional uh, sidetrack into the adventures of Kiki Cat and learning hieroglyphics, dinosaurs and toys are one of those things that just comes together magically. They work so well, and... Well, I have more than my fair share of dinosaurs and action figures decorating my office that I've collected over the years. Not only do I have, you know, your standard bone dinosaurs and your Schleich dinosaurs, but I've got dinosaur art in the form of pillowcases on my office chair, and I even invested quite heavily in framing some really nice dinosaur art that I have mounted on my wall. All right, so why am I talking all about why I love dinosaurs? and how cool they are. Well, it's not just because they make good toys and because of sort of the ancient history of them, and part of it is because of their appeal to children. Children and dinosaurs are one of those things that just goes together like, you know, peanut butter and chocolate or, you know, Arbor Day and fireworks. They look at dinosaurs as this giant thing they can't touch but still can't hurt them. When I was a kid, I was introduced to dinosaurs due to the Peabody Museum in Yale, Connecticut. This is actually uh, where the painting in my office comes from. It's a reproduction of the mural on their great hall of dinosaurs wall. I actually have, uh, took me many, many years before I was able to find it, frame it, which uh, was quite a hunt, but that's neither here nor there. So while I was turned on to dinosaurs by going to a museum, there are many, many ways children are introduced to dinosaurs. And again, the appeal, the emotional connection that children have to these animals is not just because they've been, you know, turned into cartoon characters, but it's more so that they represent primordial fear, but fear that can't get you. Because dinosaurs can only be seen in museums or Jurassic Park movies. They don't exist in real life, at least not anymore. So a child can stand up to a dinosaur. It can't hurt you, but it can still fascinate you. And that's a big reason for the emotional appeal. And because dinosaurs were wiped out, whether it was by an asteroid or aliens playing ping pong with laser guns, they don't exist anymore. All right, but here's the really interesting thing. Dinosaurs did not exist until 1842. And I don't obviously mean the animals. We know that they were alive millions of years ago. But the word dinosaur, meaning thunder lizard, was created by Owen in 1841. So he was a five-time winner of the Creepy Tall Man Award, but also became one of the first paleontologists discovering large bones and really trying to figure out where they came from. Sir Richard Owen has essentially become the father of the modern dinosaur-educated study, and his original vision of what they looked like has evolved. Uh, you know, when he first found large dinosaur bones and named them dinosaurs, he thought them more like modern lizards and just on a bigger, bigger scale. Obviously, we know today that they're more like warm-blooded creatures and probably more descendant from birds than they are reptiles. Thank you, Dr. Alan Grant. But they absolutely took the scientific community by storm when, in the 1840s and 1850s, the bones started showing up and brought to museums. In fact, scientists even ate a dinner in a giant hollow dinosaur in order to celebrate the discovery of this new extinct species. Don't believe in Google it. All right, so here's what I'm getting to. The word dinosaur was not created until the middle of the 19th century. Before that, the word didn't exist. But does that mean dinosaur bones didn't exist? I mean... Humankind goes back a lot longer than 1850. I know, I checked. There was ancient China and ancient Egypt and ancient India. So there's definitely time that happened before 1850. The world did not start in 1849. And one of the things people point out, especially on YouTube, is whether or not dinosaurs were in the Bible. Because, you know, if God created dinosaurs, then shouldn't dinosaurs be mentioned in the Bible? But if dinosaurs weren't invented until the 1850s, meaning the word, well, where are all the dinosaurs in the Bible? And there have absolutely been more than a handful of videos and books and documentaries and 
all sorts of uh, ways people have approached this, looking at some of the words for large beasts in the Bible, like the Leviathan and the Behemoth. If you look particularly at the book of Job, there are descriptions of what very much sounds like dinosaurs, describing their tails, their, uh, their eating habits, their movement. And since there was no word dinosaur, they had to call them something when the Bible was written. And behemoth was what they called them. So were they describing living creatures or were they describing perhaps bones that they saw? The same with the Leviathan, also found in the book of Job and actually other books as well. It's not just in the book of Job. Made famous by some of the woodcuts uh, in uh, early editions of the Bible from the 19th century. But the Leviathan, a sort of sea creature, and the behemoth, a land creature, are both described as these enormous, enormous creatures. So what's more plausible? That the Leviathan and the behemoth were these giant monsters walking, or that Earlier man, meaning like, you know, ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, etc., saw bones buried in mountainsides. And if they saw those bones, well, what are they going to call them if there's no word for dinosaur? Well, a lot of people have pointed out they would call them dragons. And perhaps this explains why there is so much artwork from ancient man that clearly depict dinosaurs and in a lot of ways depict them as living creatures. Of course, there have been people who have pointed out and said, oh, well, this is, you know, proof positive that dinosaurs lived with man and they weren't exterminated by, you know, giant brains, according to Futurama, but they actually were, you know, one-on-one -on -one with man, just like that Raquel Welsh movie from the 60s. Well, sure, there's absolutely that thought, but what I propose and what I feel like isn't discussed as much is that when dinosaurs were named in the 1850s, well, the, the idea that that was the very first time that humankind came into contact with dinosaur fossils, I find to be unbelievable. My theory is basically humankind has been finding dinosaur fossils for millennia. They just didn't have a word to call them dinosaur because it didn't exist yet. Did they ride around on triceratops? Um, probably not, but they had to interpret these bones, and that's where the art comes from. Another example is uh, there was an ancient elephant-esque creature, if you will, a uh, precursor to our modern elephant, found in the Mediterranean area, and when a skull of this elephant was found on Crete, well, what does this skull look like? It's kind of human-esque and rather large with a giant hole in the middle. Well, is it that far-fetched to think that ancient people would think this was the skull of a mythological creature and call it a cyclops because it had one giant eye hole? Or what about when bones of a protoceratops were found with a beak and then the claws of a what could be interpreted as a lion? Well, it's easy to see how Ancient people could see these bones and interpret it as a living creature, and it became what we think of as the griffin. I think, and this is my, my theory here, that so many mythological creatures, from dragons to unicorns to griffiths, all are the direct interpretation of ancient man looking at dinosaur bones. The word dinosaur didn't exist, so of course they were going to associate these with a variety of creatures that all became the basis for almost all mythological creatures we have. So if you saw a pterosaur buried in, you know, the mountain in the rock and, you know, people walk by and see this, what are they going to think it is? Well, of course, it's going to become what we call a dragon because they had no other word to describe it. They knew what a horse was, they knew what a cow was or a dog, but there were no words to describe these creatures. So, when the scientific community finally came together and, yes, ate inside of a giant model of what they thought a dinosaur looked like in the 1850s and agreed that the word should be dinosaur, I don't think that discounts the idea that, you know, an ancient knight or an ancient, you know, Egyptian worker or, you know, a, a, you know some an Aztec, I mean, everywhere around the world, Chinese, Japanese, people who lived in, you know, these places, I think obviously came across dinosaur bones. And when they saw them, they had to come up with some rationale for what these creatures were. 
and that's why they became the basis for what we today call mythological creatures, because there was no other way to classify them. There were no living creatures that matched them. One of my favorite quotes of all time comes from Arthur Conan Doyle from Sherlock Holmes talking about the balance of probability, and that if we have to choose the most likely scenario, it is the scientific use of the imagination. And I think that applies perfectly to the concept of dinosaurs. If we didn't have a word for dinosaur until the 1850s, and if thinking that no human being saw dinosaur bones until the 1850s, honestly, I think that is an absurd concept. Of course people did. And that's why instead of dinosaurs, they named them all sorts of things, which became the basis of all mythological creatures that were spawned from the imagination, influenced by finding ancient dinosaur bones. All right, I know this was a little bit different from the usual video, but I hope you enjoyed it. Please do share it with others, and uh, I'll see you in the comment section for more videos to come. Thanks so much.